Hi everyone, my name is Jay Mystery. I'm Professor of Environmental Geography at Royal Holloway. And in today's lecture, I'm going to be talking about biocultural landscapes. Um, what do we mean by biocultural landscapes? Um, these are uh, landscapes that arise from the dynamic links and feedbacks um, between biological diversity and human cultural diversity. And I'm going to explain more about that as we go on. So in this presentation, um, I'm going to focus on the Amazon biome and in particular the Rupununi region in Guyana. Um, and what I want to explain is um, some of the factors for the high biodiversity in the region, um, the really critical role of the indigenous inhabitants um, in the way that they sustainably manage the ecosystems. Um, I want to talk about some of the challenges um, that the people and the and the ecosystem have, and then also some of the potential mitigation uh, approaches or strategies that can be taken. So first, a little bit of context in terms of Guyana, in case you're not quite sure where it is and what it's about. Um, so Guyana is the third smallest country in South America, um, just slightly smaller than the UK. Um, most of the land um, is covered in dense rainforest, but it also has significant areas of savanna and wetlands. Um, amazingly, for a country that is slightly smaller than the UK, it has a, only has a population of about 750,000 people. So you can imagine that, um, you know, there's a lot of still standing primary um, vegetation, particularly primary rainforest um, in this area. Uh, the majority of the population are of Afro or Indo-Guyanese uh, descent um, and so and they live mostly on the coastal region so um, around Georgetown which is the capital on the coast and some of the other main towns along along the coastal region and only about five percent of the population live in the interior um, and and the majority of those were, are indigenous peoples um, a lot of the economic activities that the country has relies on natural resources. Um, this includes mining, logging. Um, they do agriculture, a lot of rice production, for example. There used to be a lot of sugarcane production um, on the coast as well, but they do a lot of rice now as well. Um, but that's only about 3% in terms of the kind of uh, land under cultivation. So it's not, it's not a lot. Um, at the moment, it's classified as a middle income country. Um, with with still with high levels of inequality and um, poor governance in terms of uh, transparency, freedom of speech. Um, there's a lot of issues with corruption, for example. Um, and very interestingly, um, they have recently discovered oil offshore. So that happened a couple of years ago and they're in the process of starting to um, get that, take that oil um, out of the sea and they're working with Exxon Mobil and there are a lot of controversies around this relationship and how the funds that will come out of this oil production uh, will be used and, and who it will benefit. Um, and there have been some um, contestations against the oil um, extraction. Um, some kind of legal um, petitions have been put in by civil society and some indigenous organizations. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's just to give you a little bit of a context of, uh, of Guyana. So if we go and look at more specifically at the Rupununi region, um, so the Rupununi, there's a map, you can see Georgetown on the capital. There's basically one main road that connects from Georgetown all the way to a town called Lethem, which is on the border with Brazil. So the Rupununi is actually located in the southwest area of Guyana, uh, very close to Brazil. Um, it, it's very unique in that it has this kind of mosaic of rainforest, savanna and wetland uh, ecosystems. So you have a lot of um, standing primary rainforest. Um, you have natural savanna, savanna that has been there for hundreds of thousands of years. Um, and then you have a lot of rivers, ponds, creeks, um, these types of wetland um, ecosystems. Uh, and they're all connected together. So 
um, the region has a very distinct uh, wet and dry season climatically and so during the wet season and during the rainy season uh, you have the a lot of flooding um, and this this flooding regime that creates a kind of seasonal migration of species uh, across different kinds of waterways and one of the theories um, is that you have the connection of the Amazon and the Essequibo um, hydrological basins um, that allow this migration of species and that's why uh, you have such high biodiversity in this region. So uh, not only does this region support over 450 freshwater fish, for example, um, but it also has a lot of endemic species, species that are, you can only find in this place. Um, that includes some of what they call the giants. So they have the, the world's largest freshwater fish, which is called the Arapaima. They have the giant river otter, they have black caiman, which are huge crocodilians, um, giant anteaters, etc. So um, just to give you a little bit of an idea of the biodiversity, uh, we're now, I'm now going to show you a very short animation uh, that was made as part of a project that I was working on and that explains the, um, the, the hydrological dynamics of this particular region and how that supports the biodiversity. So let's watch that. On the sparsely populated northeast shoulder of South America sits Kayana, home to one of the world's most unique and diverse ecosystems, the Rupununi wetlands. Although wetlands cover only 6% of the Earth's land surface, they are vital for sustaining our lives. Iconic wetlands such as Southern Africa's Okavango Delta, the Florida Everglade, and Brazil's Pantanal are also globally recognized for their wildlife diversity but the Rupununi wetlands boast an unrivaled array of wildlife with over 1,400 types of animals. To understand why this area has such diverse wildlife, we have to go back in time. A huge river called the Proto-Barbies carved the rift valley as it flowed through the entire region to the Atlantic. Later, when the land rose, the water split with the eastern rivers flowing north and the western rivers flowing south. But the Rupununi wetlands continue to provide a link between the Amazon and the Essequibo waters, reflecting the ancient river 2.6 million years after it disappeared. During the rainy season, when the region's savannas and forests flood, the waters of the two rivers merge, forming wetlands, allowing animals to move between them. For most of the year, the Rupununi wetlands shrink and the two rivers are separate. Much of the savanna is sun-baked and dry. When heavy rain falls in the mountains, the rivers burst their banks. The Earring River floods out across the Rupununi wetlands and flows back up the Pirara Creek. The Rupununi River rises and floods back up the Banuni Creek, creating a temporary lake, recreating the historic portal between the two rivers. During the floods, fish such as the giant arapaima move out across the Rupununi wetlands to spawn. At this time of plenty, the vast numbers of fish attract a rainbow of birds, giant river otters, and caiman. It is also an important time for local communities to hunt and fish. And tourists come to view the mixing of wildlife from the Amazon and the Esquibo basins. As the waters recede, the fish and other wildlife travel back to the main rivers until next year's flood. The Rupununi wetlands sustain the region's rich wildlife and the livelihoods of the 8,000 people who live there. It is truly the heartbeat of Guyana. You saw in the animation about how um, the species move around um, during the flooding and how important that is. And I'm going to come back to to those hydrological connections later on when we talk about the, the challenges to the region. Um, as you saw in the animation, um, indigenous the, the, whole, the whole region supports uh, indigenous communities uh, who have lived there for thousands of years. At the moment, there's a population of about 9,000 people um, in the region who are predominantly of the Makushi and Wapishan uh, groups. Um, they live in small settlements, in villages, um, and their main livelihood 
are based on rotational forest farming, um, where they will be cutting uh, small areas, approximately one hectare um, in the forest, and they will then um, burn that vegetation and then they will plant crops. Uh, and they normally do that in the dry season in, in readiness for when the rains arrive to obviously feed their crops with water. Um, and the main crop that they grow is cassava. Um, this is a species, uh, a root vegetable, um, which is uh, a, their staple. And they have many, many, many different varieties of, of this cassava. Um, that they grow for that are some are like drought resistant, flood resistant, some grow within and can be harvested within a couple of months, some take longer, some are good for storage, some are good for eating fresh. So they have many different types of varieties that they grow. And they then don't just eat that as they are, but they process that into different kinds of products as well, such as such as different types of bread and something they call farine, which is kind of like looks like breadcrumbs, basically, which can be stored for a very long time. Um, they also do um, hunting, fishing, and they also gather lots of resources as well. So you can see that the all the, most of their livelihood is based on um, natural resources or the resources that they can access on their land. Um, fish in particular is very important um, and it's estimated that it provides about 60% of their diet. So the wetlands particularly are crucial in terms of um, sustaining their lives. And so, yeah, the quality and the um, sustainability of that is really important. As you also saw on the little animation, um, this biocultural landscape, so this combination of biodiversity and local communities living together and sustaining each other um, is a real draw for ecotourism. So um, this particular region of Guyana has a number of different ecotourism resorts and uh, ventures, uh, all mostly very small scale at the moment. Um, some run by communities, some run by tourist agents. Uh, travel agents that are based in Georgetown in the capital. Uh, you can see here in the in the bottom uh, left uh, of Cayman House, and I'll talk a little bit about Yupikari Village, which is where Cayman House is based, which is a eco resort, um, has has won awards in terms of its sustainability and the way it combines both the, bio the biodiversity and the cultural diversity elements in its ecotourism uh, offerings. And people come to see all the big animals, like I said, the big giants, also things like jaguars and other big cats, but also it's a huge bird watching um, area because there's hundreds of birds um, that people come to see and to spot. So what I want to talk about now is like, um, how is it that um, this biodiversity or this and this cultural diversity, how do they come together? And how is this biocultural landscape maintained? Well, one of the things that is really important is basically the the kind of practices that the that the commun indigenous communities have. And when we think about these practices, we what we kind of in in terms of the research that I've been doing, um, we're kind of looking at these as kind of community what we call community owned solutions. And these are practices that where the local community uh, needs it, uh, they do it themselves, they have control or they make the decisions about these particular practices, um, they have local benefits, um, they, are, they are generally fair to both the environment in that they're looking after the environment and they're also looking after their communities. Um, it's really crucial for the future of their communities and importantly, it's also solutions that are self-reliant and they don't dep depend on long-term external support. So these practices that people um, do in the landscape, um, they are much more sustainable than, for example, uh, an organisation or uh, initiative coming into the region and telling from outside not really knowing the context, not knowing the environment, not knowing the culture, uh, and trying to impose um, different types of solutions or different types of interventions in the area. And so what we were looking at is like, how how are these particular practices that the community do, how do they maintain these bicultural 
landscapes. So the, how do these community-owned solutions contribute to the landscape? So in some research that I was doing with um, my partners, my indigenous uh, organisations in Guyana, um, we looked at the different types of uh, community owned solutions from the Ripanuni region that contribute to this biocultural landscape. And there's lots, lots and lots and lots. And so we don't have time to go through all of them. But here I just want to give you a little bit of a taste of some of them. So um, we talked about fishing um, and how sustainable fishing is really important <clears throat> in terms of um, the you know, the livelihoods of people, but also the way that they do their fishing actually also maintains the integrity of the ecosystem. So they're using quite low impact techniques, um, could be bows and arrows, hooks, for example, um, sometimes using small nets. But some of these techniques are uh, also aligned in terms of types of fish species that they're looking at. So, for example, if they're catching um, certain fish that live underneath rocks then they'll be diving for those or they'll be looking at catching fish at different times of the year and they'll be using different techniques aligned to that so they have a very intricate way of doing their fishing that is very aligned with the species that they're catching and the ecosystem in which they're doing their fishing um, you also have transmission of culture to youth so they have these uh, they want to make sure that the future generations um, are also learning about the culture and their traditional knowledge. So they have different ways that they teach young people. Um, a lot of it is by practice, by kind of doing. So actually accompanying older people to the farm or fishing or wherever it might be. But they also have other kinds of ways within the community that they do uh, teach people and teach young people how to um, different aspects of their culture. Um, you have the farming that I already talked about and the farming techniques. They have lots of different types of farming techniques, uh, depending on the soils, um, depending on the variety of, of cassava and the different types of crops that they grow, um, depending, depending on the climate. Um, so again, farming techniques are very important and they're always doing low impact, maintaining uh, areas for wildlife, um, so it's not it's not having a, a, a huge impact on, on the ecosystem. Um, other important aspects that to think about in terms of their solutions of maintaining the landscape, uh, community self-help is really important. They still do a lot of work together as a community um, that could be building roads, that could be clearing it, their farms, uh, could be cleaning the village, for example. So there's this kind of um, sense of solidarity between them, which is really important in terms of this idea that there's solidarity with the ecosystem, but there's also solidarity between communities and cultures as well. And then, you know, they are um, obviously then they live in a remote place, but they're not isolated in terms of from the world. So, you know, they also have ways of kind of engaging with non-Indigenous technologies. So, for example, they have radio, internet, and they're kind of using those to promote their culture, promote um, the area that they work in. Um, also, in terms of local civil society organisation and partnerships, they work with lots of different people um, in terms of helping to maintain their biocultural landscape as well. Um, and so when you look at these community and solutions and you look at these practices that people have and you think, what are the what are the key things there that you really need to maintain this biocultural um, landscape? And you can see that here's a list, uh, first of all. Um, indigenous knowledge, so having this intimate knowledge of the landscape um, and nature and the biodiversity is, is really important in terms of being able to maintain that biocultural landscape. Um, having good local leadership, so having leaders that, um, you know, who are respected and who lead their communities and um, try to maintain those practices as well is very important, while being open to new things as well. This idea that I talked about before, this idea of collective spirits or community cohesion, um, these kind of value systems are really important. That's what kind of maintains those communities together, uh, bring, brings a kind of sense of collectiveness to what they're doing. Uh, working with partnerships and networks, 
Um, so always working with other people. So, for example, the animation that you saw that we produced as part of a project, it was to promote um, the region to decision makers and politicians. And it was it was it was done in collaboration with the indigenous communities, but WWF and other organizations as well. Um, and then also this idea of being proud about these practices and breaking away from this idea of what we call deficit model. So, um, you know, there is a history um, of indigenous colonization um, and indigenous people um, being, um, you know, told that what they know is not value is not valuable and that their knowledge is not worthwhile. Um, and this has kind of led to this idea of this deficit model where people think that they don't have the skills or they don't have the knowledge um, to be able to manage their environment when in fact they do. But it's just that, you know, over time, they've just been told over and over again that they're worthless. And so it's kind of like that's the way they kind of start thinking themselves. And so it's kind of like breaking away from that idea that actually that's not true and that traditional knowledge, indigenous knowledge, and the practices that they have in maintaining their biocultural landscape is actually just as important as a scientific approach, for example, um, in terms of knowing about how the landscape works and how nature works. So that's really important. And to bring that kind of pride to people and that confidence um, helps people to maintain their environment because they feel proud about it. They want to maintain it. Um, thinking about um, the different community and solutions that I mentioned before, we can think of them just at the local scale, but actually they have wider implications. So in this diagram, you can see that um, I've just added to those local um, practices, I've kind of said, well, what's the bigger picture here? So if you think about sustainable fishing, I'm not going to go through all of them, but if you think about sustainable fishing, you can see that actually, if you incorporate sustainable resource management practices, such as those sustainable fishing methods I talked about, that can actually promote the ecosystem integrity and it can also promote food security. So maintaining those techniques is important for the local scale, but it's also important at a larger scale as well. Um, if you think about um, how the communities are trying to engage their young people and teach their young people about traditional knowledge, that's really important in terms of at a bigger scale, because by maintaining young people in, in, in these kinds of practices and giving them that knowledge also ensures that in the future they, they will continue to be stewards of of their environment and of nature as well. So you can see that all of these different practices uh, or community and solutions have wider implications, not just for the people in the Rapununi, but also for the country as Guyana, but I would also say as an international community, um, we need to learn from some of these things because some of these practices and their wider implications are very relevant to our way of life as well about things that we need to think about in terms of not maintaining our ecosystem and our communities as well. Okay, so um, thinking about challenges, so there are a lot of issues in terms of opinion. You saw from the beginning when I talked about the context of Guyana um, that, you know, the government is middle income, but there are huge levels of inequality. Um, they rely on extractive activities in terms of getting a lot of their income. So again, extractive activities, particularly mining, uh, are pretty uh, challenging in the Rapanini. And, you know, mining, it's not just about mining. There's a lot of implications around something like mining. So for example, you have to deforest uh, land to do mining so that deforestation and mining always go together. Um, obviously, depending on the way that mining is done, there is big uh, probability that there's going to be pollution. We talked already about how 60% of the diet of the local inhabitants is from fish. So pollution into the rivers is a huge issue and can have huge down uh, downscale or down river effects basically on people's livelihoods and their health. Um, and then also in terms of 
some mining activities, you know, um, it, it involves people sometimes going to these areas uh, where they're more likely, for example, to catch malaria, um, they're more likely, for example, to be involved in drugs, um, and there are lots of social implications, for example, young Indigenous women that end up in these areas and um, are exploited in various ways, including prostitution. So there are huge, not just ecological impacts of mining, but there are also big social impacts as well to think about. Um, climate change. So um, people are feeling the effects of climate change, you know, um, the the distinct seasonality that I talked about before, the flooding and the and the dry, the dry season, um, sometimes that is is not coming in the way that they know um, and that they have known from before. Um, they're having more droughts. Sometimes they're having a lot of flooding, so they're having more extreme kinds of events. And again, that has big implications on many things, such as, for example, their farming and in areas that they might have been safely farmed before being flooded out, which, for example, has happened this year that I know of. Um, they also have large scale infrastructure projects, so the government like to come in and do some um, large scale projects many times without with very little consultation to the local people and the indigenous communities um some of the ones that are have been happening in recent times have been like road building um dams and commercial farms um in terms of the road i think this is an important just point to to tell you about if you look at the the photo on the bottom left um you can see that that is the main road that is the main road that connects the Ripanuni to Georgetown, the capital, and then to the Brazilian border. And you can see that there are many times when it's under the water. So this road is not tarmacked, it's just a dirt road. And they've been talking about tarmacking it for a long time. But the problem with trying to, to do this road is that it, it goes through this very fragile hydrological system that you saw in the animation. So any kind of improvement to this road has to really take into account how the hydrology works because it's so intricate um, and there is a big chance that if it's done in the wrong way you could block some of those hydrological links that is actually uh, important and so critical for the biodiversity and the migration of species across the different water basins so just things like that are really important Obviously, things like commercial farming could have important implications for the use of pesticides, which has happened as well, um, and how that, again, could run off into waterways um, and rivers uh, and, and causing pollution. And again, the knock-on impacts of that on health and fish, fish um, uh, quantities. Um, obviously, there is the challenge of being very remote. Um, they have this one road that connects them. Uh, sometimes it's underwater, so it's not so easy to get there. Um, communications, internet is very patchy. Um, phone connection is very patchy, it's not everywhere. Um, and there's very few kind of basic services. They have to always go to the city to get like health services, etc. So remoteness is also a challenge to them. Um, land tenure and rights. So, you know, the, some villages they do have rights to their land, but it's all kind of demarcated into small sections. So the whole Ripanuni is a kind of combination of indigenous land, state land, and sometimes private land. So trying to maintain this kind of uh, landscape is really tricky because there's a lot of different types of actors or landowners in this issue. And a lot of the indigenous community, and there's also, I forgot to say, there's also some protected areas as well. So some kind of national parks um, that they don't have rights to, that belong to the state, but they used to have rights to. So there is tension there between people wanting more rights to land and more access to the resources in, in land that is not necessarily uh, under their ownership now, but used to be land that they used to have before. Um, and then Indigenous voice and representation decision making. So this is a challenge too, because um, as I said, they're very remote, so they don't have good communication. So how do they get their concerns into to the people that are making decisions? And in many cases, it's not them. So how can they have more voice in that decision making process? Um, and how can they have more representation in the decisions that are made about the way the Ripanuni 
is governed um, and what kind of development or conservation initiatives take place in the in the area. So when we think about the mitigation strategies, then you know what ways can we um, what would be the best ways in terms of trying to maintain this biocultural landscape um, in the context of some of those challenges? Well, I think primary the the foremost probably what everybody would say and definitely the indigenous communities would say is to promote la indigenous land rights so we have a lot of um uh evidence uh globally at a global scale um that suggests that you know areas that are managed or owned by indigenous peoples have the highest biodiversity and uh carbon on their on their on their land so actually uh, I think one of the uh, studies that was done not long ago estimated that about a quarter of the land surface um, is uh, managed and owned by uh, Indigenous peoples and about 40% coincide with areas of high biodiversity. So actually promoting Indigenous land rights would enable people to safely and um, with security practice their community and solutions that we know maintain those landscapes and uh, the biodiversity on them. Um, promoting traditional knowledge, as I said before, you saw that one of the one of the prerequisites for these community and solutions is having traditional knowledge and, and having intimate traditional knowledge. So it's really important to continue promoting that and um, making it clear that traditional knowledge is just as legitimate as scientific knowledge, particularly in young people um, who are in the kind of more uh, national level kind of schooling system that doesn't really take into account traditional knowledge at all. So I think that's really important. Um, obviously, trying to reduce investment in these major infrastructure projects. So um, trying to show how actually these projects are in many cases are very detrimental and that if any kind of projects are done such as road building they have to be done in a very very careful way and in a way that really takes into account the local um physical um uh the biophysical nature of the area and then kind of looking at incentivizing other forms of uh income generation so things like ecotourism um, or non-product, non-timber forest products. So collecting, gathering products from the from the forest in a sustainable way that can then be marketed. Um, so that could be, you know, so for example, some communities have been looking at different kinds of cosmetic products based on different uh, tree species that they have. And obviously, they, I've talked about ecotourism already. Um, and then building capacity um, for Indigenous people themselves to be able to monitor their own environments and to have better communications. Um, in this picture, you can see this is from a project um, that I was part of um, that was actually um, doing drone su drone surveys um, over the Rapinini to map that those waterways. The, and actually, the maps that came out of these drone surveys helped to produce that animation that I showed you before, and and these and as part of that project, it was it involved indigenous people uh, learning to fly those drones and to look at the images and to try to analyse what they mean, um, and so that they also are able to have uh, information at their fingertips to be able to talk to people and to particularly to politicians and decision makers, um, and then also using uh, video. So I've been doing a lot of work. Uh, on participatory video where, where communities are making videos about their concerns. So because they're so remote and they can't necessarily travel, sometimes what they can do is actually make videos about issues and th these can then be um, sent uh, to politicians and to other people to show what they're kind of concerned about or some of the issues that they might need addressing. I think importantly, you need a diversity of strategies. So it's like you need all of these things. Just doing one is not enough. Um, for example, a lot of people think ecotourism is the is the way to um, is is the way that you know a lot of these communities are going to come out of poverty or that they're going to be able to um, improve their situation. And it's true that ecotourism is is one option, but it's only one option. Um, you can see like the pandemic has you know, over this last year, and it's basically completely crushed ecosystem, ecotourism, 
um, in the European Union and all over the world. Um, so just relying on one strategy is not a good idea. Um, and you need a whole diversity of ways to ensure that these, these landscapes are maintained. Okay, um, and kind of just to finish off here, um, I just wanted to show you this um, little map. Um, it's uh, a map of a village called Yupakari um, in, in the Rapanuni, and you can see that it's, it has its territory or its land, the, the land that it owns, uh, is about 523 kilometres squared. Um, and what we used here was a little software called iTree, which you can look up, um, and it enables you to give yourself a very, very rough estimate. So it's nothing very like precise, but it kind of gives you a bit of an idea on um, how much carbon a particular area might be absorbing. Um, and so when you do this for the little village of Yupakari and its land, uh, you can see that 523 kilometres squares has the potential to absorb about 120,000 tonnes of carbon dioxide a year. Um, and if you then calculate that very roughly, that would be worth about 14 million pounds. So you can see that actually helping to maintain these biocultural landscapes has, as I said before, when I was talking about the community and solutions, it's not just a local uh, benefit, but it's actually a global benefit. So um, I think my closing statement there is that, you know, we need to recognise the critical role of Indigenous peoples um, in biocultural landscapes um, and in maintaining biodiversity um, and also contributing to climate change mitigation. OK, so I hope I hope you enjoyed that lecture and um, I'll be looking forward to answering your some of your questions.